Good morning, and uh, thanks, uh, Jeff, for uh, setting us up. Uh, I'm Clay Chandler. I am joined uh, here with uh, three very distinguished uh, experts to discuss the subject of platform economies, how we're all connected, uh, and this new sort of gig economy that's evolving on top of these platforms. Uh, I'm joined by uh, Nathan, uh, Nathan uh, Bletcherzak uh, from Airbnb, co-founder. Uh, Zhang Zading, co-founder of OFO, on the far end there, and in the center, uh, Hans Tong uh, from uh, GGV Capital. Um, three uh, excellent perspectives to be able to approach this uh, topic. Uh, I thought maybe I might start with Hans. Um, you've been sort of going in and out. Uh, you were, were uh, kind enough to join us for uh, parts of uh, Brainstorm uh, Tech over the other end of town the other day. What are you, what are you learning as, uh, in the course of these discussions? I think the, uh, it's the first time that um, Fortune has done brainstorm tech in, outside of the U.S. and it's the first time that uh, the global forum happens in, uh, in China. So I think uh, I've been going to uh, your events in Aspen, I'm sure Nate has been there as well, and it's fantastic. Um, but having done this in China, you see a different perspective. You, you see a lot more thinking around U.S. is great, is amazing, but there's some, something else called China that's also equally interesting and powerful and growing fast. How the two will, will the interact with each other becomes quite fascinating through all the sessions that we have had over the last few days. So I think it's just very, very rewarding to see the plethora of perspectives. That's really interesting. I mean, I've had that same perspective as well. You kind of see where uh, models are similar, where they're different, where people are kind of looking each over, uh, other over, trying to learn. Um, Nate, obviously Airbnb, uh, one of the fantastic platforms uh, that originated uh, from the U.S., uh, a platform that everybody's trying to copy and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, find uh, spin-offs of. Uh, and now you're spending a lot of time here in China. You're overseeing Airbnb's rollout uh, in China. Talk to us a little bit about that and your experience, how much time you're spending here and uh, how you're going about understanding how to adapt the great uh, platform that's been so successful in this very uh, different market. Sure, sure. So China is a very important market for us because it is the largest market in the world for travel, um, both domestically and uh, internationally, uh, and is, of course, continuing to grow. Uh, and for that reason, uh, I've taken on the role of chairman of China. Uh, so I'm spending about uh, one trip a month uh, to China and really doing two things. One, making sure that our local team here in Beijing, we have over 100 employees, mm -hmm. um, is fully empowered and basically autonomous, at the same time bringing to bear the resources of the global organization when necessary. And so I really have a foot in both, both worlds. We've seen a lot of success here. Uh, China is now our fastest growing market uh, in the history of the company domestically. Uh, as well as the second fastest growing market in terms of outbound travel. We've had about 10 million uh, Chinese guests use Airbnb, half of that within the last year. Really? Um, wow. And uh, wow. we have 150,000 homes now in China on Airbnb. You know, originally our strategy was to focus on the outbound, but we've quickly seen Chinese guests who've gone abroad come back and spread the idea word of mouth. And so very organically, we've seen this domestic business rise up and, and become our fastest growing. That's business. fascinating. So of those, it's 150,000, is that right? That are 150,000 homes uh, uh, live, active right now in China, and that's doubled over the last year. And, and are the people that are, that are staying in those homes, are they primarily Chinese staying in the homes of other Chinese, or are you, are you getting much... Uh, uh, cross uh, uh, Pacific tra uh, traffic and uh, people coming from outside China to stay in those homes. It's primarily domestic, domestic. Yeah. So Chinese guests staying in Chinese yeah. homes. But you know, one of the benefits uh, is our global audience, and so we definitely do have inbound travel, especially into major cities like Shanghai. Huh. How do you deal with, wait, with on the outbound traffic? How do you deal with kind of language issues, cultural issues, people that might be traveling for a first time or something like that? Well, I think it travels inherently global and cross-cultural, and so I think there's an expectation that you have to uh, have some flexibility in, uh, in terms of expectations. <laughs> yeah. you know, at the same time, we have put a huge amount of effort into localization. Uh, the site's in 30 different languages. Our support is in many different languages. Mm -hmm. We also offer tools like uh, embedded uh, translation tools. Uh, so okay. if you're having a message yeah. uh, through the site, you can in real time translate. And the, uh, of the 150,000 uh, uh, properties in China, are they 
primarily concentrated in certain geographic areas, or are they fairly widely dispersed uh, throughout the world? Well, they certainly concentrate in cities, as you might expect, yeah. but it is also one of the magical things about the platform is, you know, anyone anywhere can do this. And right. so uh, I, would, I would challenge you to find a place uh, in China or in the world where you can't find an Airbnb. Huh. Globally, we have over 4 million homes, 191 countries, over 65,000 cities. So it's, it's pretty much everywhere. And are you finding that there are things that you have needed to do to adapt the platform to Chinese, uh, Chinese consumers? Uh, the biggest gains have been in product localization. Um, there's just such a native internet ecosystem here of, of providers and consumer services that if you, if you really want to maximize conversion, you have to localize the product. Um, so what, what I mean by that is you know, integrating with uh, WeChat, integrating with uh, the mobile stores, right. yeah. mobile uh, app stores, uh, localizing with local payments was a huge uh, lift, double digit improvement in conversion when we did that. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, really? so, so people can use Alipay or whatever to and we yeah. pay. Yep. And pay. Yeah. Yeah. And then performance has also been really important to you know make sure that uh, you can serve up the site uh, locally. Huh. Uh, very interesting. How do you handle the? Um, uh, I mean, obviously, if you check into any hotel, which the de facto these are hotels in China, you've got to uh, present your passport. You've got to be registered, have some kind of an ID. How do you handle that aspect uh, of it from a kind of regulatory standpoint? Yeah, well that process has to be uh, reinvented and pioneered to work with this new model. Uh, the good news is, you know, we've seen a lot of support uh, from the government, especially here in China. Yeah. Uh, at, at the national level, I think there's a huge recognition of the potential of the sharing economy. Right. So they've, they've signaled, you know, this is important. Uh, at the local level, uh, we've signed uh, MOUs, Memorandums of Understanding, with about a dozen different municipalities to basically co-develop home sharing, to acknowledge that this is something that we both want to see happen. Uh, we don't have all the specifics figured out, yeah. uh, but we're going to engage in dialogue proactively uh, and work through some of these things. Um, and so uh, over time, what are all the things that the platform can take care of so that individuals don't need to worry about it, whether it's payments, customer service, marketing, or GR compliance? I see. Um, we turn to uh, Sading uh, Ofo. This is uh, one of the amazing uh, platform stories, not just in China, but uh, anywhere. Um, we were discussing this uh, at, uh, at Brainstorm Tech the other day, but the numbers on how quickly China's uh, bike sharing companies have rolled out are just staggering. I mean, yeah. it, we, we mentioned this also uh, uh, in Aspen this summer, but uh, you know, the, the bike sharing's been around a long time in the United States. There are a number of, mm -hmm. maybe 50 cities that are started in Denver and kind of has spread from there. But the bike sharing association from all these metropolitan governments did a study last year and they were boasting about the fact that they had achieved a record number uh, of, uh, uh, of bike rentals for the year and it was uh, I think 28 million. So tell us what your traffic is uh, in terms of bike shares on a daily, monthly basis. Okay. Uh, Doing the shared bicycles that was in 2015, I was still in the school at that time. After one year's rapid development, by the end of 2016, we just announced that we will make our inroads to cities. To date, we have entered the 20 countries. We have fulfilled our goals. The 20 destinations is Paris or France. That means we have made deployments over 200 cities of uh, 20 countries. The shared bikes has gained such a strong momentum of growth. The shared bicycles are everywhere. I think the customers' demands are the major drivers for this development. In the first place, in the beginning, we validated this process in the small areas, but now we are making it into a college and expand our business everywhere. I see our growth is quite momental. On our platform, we have over 10 million shared bikes on our platform. And the daily ordering was about 32 million. Uh, Taobao is the largest trading platform in China. We are owning next to it. So 30, about 30 million per day. Is that uh, right? So right? 32 million. 32 million per day. Yeah. Okay. And 10 million bikes uh, around the world. Yeah. So uh, global cities now. So you've got you're in 200 cities around the world. But how many of those are non-Chinese? Uh, 50 cities. 
Okay. 50 cities. 50 cities. So in those cities uh, outside of China, as you expand into them, um, what are you, I mean, I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked Nate, which is how do you take a model that was developed for uh, consumers in China and have you had to adapt it to conditions in other markets? What have you done? Hmm. For our global expansion, we have our own idea. We might adopt the different models in foreign countries because they are quite different from China. For example, the cultural difference. The non-Chinese countries will have very unique cultures. The bicycle riding culture is prevailing in foreign countries, including Europe and the US, and now transportation network is well developed. So now operation we for shared bikes is different from China. That means we need to make some adjustments or adapt the model. What did we do? Before we end a city, we will make a list, a checklist. Yeah, on the checklist, we will cover the information, including the demographic distribution, geo situations, or the popularity of the bicycle riding culture, what now daily travel or transportation models. On the basis of this checklist, we will keep checking which destination or which city is a better target for us. Besides, we need to communicate with the local government. For example, before we went to a city in Italy, we knew that we have making some operations in Milano of Italy. The frequency of bicycle sharing in Milano is nearly on par with the first tier cities in China, Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen, which really surprised us. But it doesn't mean that we are making deployments or put our bicycles blindfoldedly. We want to establish good bonds with the local government, for example, to sign the MOE and to fulfill the regulatory requirements of the local government. In the uh, amazing photos of, of bikes uh, that are kind of piled up uh, uh, in, in places Riding around colors. the cities, that you know, either where riders just kind of use them and toss them. In a, um, I mean, one of the difficulties with the, the bike sharing, of course, as you know, is that often you get people that want to ride the bikes to one place, but they don't want to ride them back. For example, if it's a hilly terrain, they're happy to ride it downhill, but they don't want to, especially in the summer, ride it back uphill again. Um, and my sense is that in, in China, the authorities have been a little more tolerant <coughs> of bikes piling up uh, on city streets and not being dispersed in a kind of efficient way than authorities uh, in, in municipal areas in the United States might be. And particularly in, in the US, uh, the bike sharing model is, a, is often a partnering model with the municipal government. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, you've got to get regulatory approval from the partner of your competitor in that local area. How do you, how do you handle that problem? Uh, in actual fact, we consider us as a startup. We need to address the problems when we encounter problems, we shouldn't be fear fear of the problems. In the beginning, they might be the powering of the shared bicycles where the bicycles will be vandalized or damaged by some people intentionally. We have several ways to deal with it. Number one, we need to research on the users' uh, demands and the user behaviors. Why do they damage our shared bicycles? doesn't mean that we do not have enough bicycles or just only want to make some intentional damages. Our personal thinking that if the demand is not big enough, how can we meet the user's demands scientifically and reasonably? If they are want to make some damages intentionally, we have a credit system. When the users are making use of bicycles, their behaviors will be recorded on the basis of your using experience or user record, we will score and read so that we can regulate our behaviors. If you damage our bicycles intentionally, that means in the future you are not entitled to make use of our shared bicycles. In actual fact, in the foreign countries competition, we needed to communicate with local partners or competitors. We know that in the US, they are home to a lot of US-based uh, shared biking companies, we might compete against them. But for all four, we want to find our own. 
operational approach and to locate the user's demands more accurately. Uh, one of the companies that you're invested in, Linebike, which is uh, sort of mm -hmm. in this space. Linebike is an amazing story. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a bunch of, uh, what, three co-founders, is that maybe? Two co-founders. Two co-founders. They're both uh, originally born in China. Yes. They went to school in the Bay Area. That's right. They worked for, uh, went for Tencent. W w Western companies. They worked for Chinese companies. Yeah. And then realized that what Ofo and Mobike and the 30 other companies that are in this space mm -hmm. in China were doing was actually a really great idea. Came to you, raised a bunch of money, some other people, and uh, off to the races. Uh, um, I guess uh, Andreessen Horowitz is a big backer of them, is that right? right? Um, and um, so why would we, who, who should we bet on to succeed in the, in the U.S. market? <laughs> I mean, it's just interesting to me. We've got these sort of, these, we have the, the kind of homegrown Chinese uh, competitors versus the local Chinese competitors, <laughs> but they're both the dominant players in the space, the, it looks like. The, the short answer is that different um, category yeah. uh, will predispose selection of different kind of winners. Yeah. Um, so taking uh, Airbnb as an example, right. we're investing in Airbnb. Right. We're also investor in Tuja in, in China. Mm. And we look at them actually even though right. it's a similar model, right. but very different segment, customer segmentation, yeah. and the community feel of those co two companies with their users are also quite different. Yeah. So we, we, and then because travel is a global sector, we think that Airbnb will do very well. And in China, Tuja can take a certain segment of the population and do very well as well. Right. So they could be orthogonal to each other, even right. though they're in the same space. So we think there could be multiple winners in, in, that, in that area. On this end, we're an investor in number three player, Hello Bike, um, huh. that, that's now backed by Alibaba and, and Financial. As you know, Tencent backed uh, Mobike right. and Didi uh, backed uh, Ofo. Right. So yeah, these have right. three players in China all going after different parts of China and, and, and competing and overlapping right. and, and right. stuff. And at the same time, like you pointed out, we also invested in land bike because in the U.S., like you pointed out, there's more regulation. Right. In China, because transportation is such a big problem right. that you need ride sharing and bike sharing, both of them, to in the it. short term yeah. to alleviate the traffic congestion issue. Right. So the government will be more tolerant of innovation in that category. In the U.S., you don't have as much of a problem. So the municipalities want everything being more in order. So we think that um, OFO will do well in, in, in U.S. or can do well in the U.S., but somebody who is more local, yet yeah. understand how the model should be working because they're, they know China well, someone who knows both places can deal more effectively with municipalities in the U.S. Right. and expand accordingly. And how big is uh, Linebike now? I don't think they have disclosed any public figure yet, so I can't say. <laughs> I see. So okay. they, and I think they have the race at least one round of financing that you mentioned, yeah. uh, which the horrors was a part of, and there are other stuff going on that I'm at liberty to say, okay. but it's definitely growing extremely fast Very in more than 20 cities. And it just, it's fascinating to see a team that understands what's, what's needed to compete in the U.S., and their hours are... 9.96, 9 a.m. Yeah. to 9 p.m., yeah. six days a week. Yeah. And then when, when I need to talk to them on Sunday, they're available too. Yeah. And they, they're growing, <laughs> they're moving as fast as a Chinese company, but yeah. with American sensibilities right. in the U.S. So this is why I think this is such a great, fascinating panel, because what we have here, as you can kind of hear, is the two examples of a platform model that have actually managed to kind of uh, go beyond borders and to be rolled out in the other border. I mean, uh, you know, we all know that, that the media-focused companies, China, those don't fly. Google's not here, Facebook's not here, right. you know, uh, Twitter's not here. Uh, but here's Airbnb that's got the best shot of any Chinese internet company of really making it probably uh, in China. And then we know that by, similarly in the United States, there are CFIUS problems with lots of other kind of uh, 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 Chinese investments and, and rollouts of businesses uh, in China. I mean, just the other day, DJI got into some yes. snit with the US government about were they spying uh, via consumer drones uh, uh, on American properties. So there's that kind of resistance. But if any uh, 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 model has a chance of succeeding as a Chinese kind of model that rolls out to the US, it's bike sharing. So these are the kind of two classic examples of uh, platforms that can really go global in other markets. Um, I want to open it up to your questions. Uh, I'll just have one quick question for Nate and before we do that, and because I know that there should be some good queries from the audience. Um, Hans mentioned Tuja. Um, Tuja, also uh, big investors there are C-Trip and, and then uh, Asia All Stars was Richard G's uh, yep. investment fund. I sat down with Richard uh, for uh, about an hour the other day, and he um, 
sort of explain to me this theory of why he thought that Tuja was going to be more successful in China, which I'm sure you've heard this, uh, but I'm interested to get your response to it. His argument was that the B to C play was not going to be successful in China, that the real way to go and that what Tuja is, is trying to do is to work with developers, that there's all this empty property that people hold for investment purpose in China, but that they don't really utilize it's lying empty, and that the way to get to work with developers was, was be to take that property and attach a bunch of services to it, to have a cleaning service, to have a kind of on-site concierge, to then book it, uh, you know, attach travel services to it. So that, uh, and then he is even saying that they were looking at things like uh, working with local governments to say, hey, we're going to take a, uh, we'll take tourists from uh, Yunnan province and we'll, we'll bring them to Guangdong and we'll take tourists from Guangdong and we'll take them to Yunnan and we'll be the broker in the middle of those kind of exchanges of, of package tours. That sounds like a pretty credible uh, approach to the Chinese market. Why would you think that your approach would be more successful than, than uh, the Tuja style of working with developers and, and government as opposed to uh, the sort of retail consumer? Sure. Well, I think that that's definitely one of the, the one of a couple different ways to contrast the companies. You know, I think we are famous for kind of pioneering the the C to C model uh, of of home sharing, uh, and that has led to our success globally. Uh, if it had been any other way, we would not be in 191 different countries, 65,000 different cities. So, I think one of the great advantages of, of C to C is how quickly it can scale. Um, and also how differentiated the experiences are. I think the challenge with kind of a more central management structure is both uh, how heavy it is in terms of operational cost and complexity as it gets bigger, mm -hmm. um, as well as you know, the standardization that comes with it. Now, I think standardization, there's a good side and a bad side. You know, the good mm -hmm. side is the consistency. Mm -hmm. The bad side is uh, you know, it, 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 it ends up being kind of all the same, less, differ less differentiated, and therefore, less personalization as possible. I think one of the magical things about Airbnb is, you know, literally anything you can imagine you can find on Airbnb. You know, you want a big house, you, uh, we have that. You want a, a, a small apartment with a great view, we have that. You want a cave, we have that. I mean, it just, yeah. uh, you can't get that level of differentiation uh, in a model that is um, where you're, you're buying out, you know, 10 apartments uh, in the same building uh, all at once. Uh, so I think, you know, it's important to, um, to play to your strengths. And, and I think we've, uh, even in the China market where you might argue there needs to be more handholding, we say we're gonna stick to the C2C model, but if people need help with cleaning and things like that, there's other ways to get those services. We don't have to provide it for you. We can uh, maybe create a marketplace or connect you with trusted service providers. It's interesting. Uh, well, got, I, I might yeah, yeah, to this. Sure. Uh, we, a lot of us have heard of the phrase sea turtles. Yes. Chinese uh, went to the U.S., got educated, okay. worked in the U.S., yeah. come back, sea turtles. Mm -hmm. Now the, there's a trend of city turtles, people who live in big cities. Yeah. Uh, it's getting super crammed. More and more of uh, thinking going back to the villages where the, the, uh, the, the cities that they came from right. and start bed and breakfast services right. to make it easier for people who want to get away from big city on weekends to, uh, to enjoy themselves and have a variety of experiences. Right. And that trend is what Airbnb is capturing in a domestic Chinese for Chinese market. So, and th th those are not the people that will work with developer. They're not gonna work with the government. They're doing stuff on their own and providing a variety of experiences for other people like themselves who want to get away from the city. You, you mentioned uh, the importance of uh, kind of differentiating and sort of customizing the site to what individuals want. But yet, if I remember your comments the other day at Brainstorm Tech, you said that you also thought it was important that there was a kind of a one Airbnb kind of standardized uh, experience that people you know, recognize the brand as being relatively universal and coherent. How do you reconcile those two, those two things? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think they're, they're in conflict with each other. Uh -huh. um, I think uh, our challenge is when you do a search and you, in let's say Shanghai, and you see 17,000 properties are available. Right. You know, how do we merchandise that in a way that you can easily navigate it and, and, and find what meets your expectations while still supporting so many other things that might be outside of what you're looking for? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, we got a question here. Can you stand up and uh, tell us your name? Thanks, uh, Clay. Uh, my name is Dr. Liu, uh, uh, Wear Group China President. Uh, I want to follow your question on the piling back thing, if you allow, to deepen our thinking about how to make the shared economy platform workable for us. Um, 
when uh, Siding responded to that question, uh, he explained understanding end users' need uh, is the way going forward. But I don't think that's the complete answer because that's only a matter of the issue. I think from my observation, there's a missing point that is lack of social engagement. Uh, Sorry, uh, lack, of, lack of social, social engagement. engagement. Uh, yeah. And, uh, uh, and it reflects how those entrepreneurs, when they fast move ahead, you know, consider at the same time an overall engagement strategy to make that innovation really work. Yeah. And uh, I mean engage with um, you know, authorities, regulators, alternative transport means, uh, and consumers as well. So I would like to ask further that question, do you have an overall engagement strategy? particularly but, from social responsibility point of view? That's a, that's a great question, and especially in the context of uh, Han's observation about China having this 996, always go, go, go culture. It's sometimes hard to roll out a social engagement strategy when you're just trying to get your bikes on the corner, right, and beat the competitors. So then, Sading, do you have a, an answer to that? This is a very interesting question. It's a very interesting question. And, uh, Speaking of the uh, bike sharing industry, it developed really quickly, first of all, and secondly, for the cities, especially in China, the urban planning and design uh, cannot be catching up in a short time period uh, to adapt themselves to the sh uh, sh bike sharing industry. And there might be some issues, and those are uh, within our expectation, but we need to uh, find a solution. From a company itself, uh, we need to uh, balance uh, um, the uh, distribution of the uh, bicycles instead of the uh, peak traffic time, though all those pi um, cars are piled uh, around the subway station. We need to find a, a user technology to address that um, uh, distribution, um, equally distribution uh, solution for the bikes. And also we need the other stakeholders to participate to maintain the social order. Because the cities and uh, bikes have a certain uh, relationship, very, very simple, but it needs the um, participation not only from the companies, but also, for example, uh, the NGOs, that's what we're working on. We work with those um, uh, civil societies and NGOs uh, to do some uh, uh, market education. So apart from a company itself, we that, uh, that where we need to work on, we also need the other organizations as well as individuals to maintain the social order. Because at the end of the day, it is good for the city, good for everybody. Let's do it together so that the social environment uh, in the city could be maintained. NGOs, what kind of M NGOs are we talking about? You're not talking about bike riding associations. You're talking about uh, what? In Guangzhou, uh, we have some industrial association. They are working on the education of uh, the uh, bicycle safety. And uh, also in different cities uh, in China, especially in some, uh, uh, we have uh, some uh, uh, party member uh, advertising team. They will work with the street um, uh, managers as well as the organizations. And then we will uh, provide reminder if there is accumulation of a, or piling of a bike at a certain area. Reminder on the platform telling our employees that we need to send people to address that piling issue. And also in this process, uh, we communicate a certain um, we establish a mechanism to communicate. And meanwhile, uh, we are working with those uh, p uh, competent authority as well as stakeholders to address the problem. Because in a larger scope, we would like to connect everybody instead of uh, relying on ourselves to operate everything. Hey, do you have a thought? I might just yeah. add, I, I think it's incredibly important to build a value proposition for all the stakeholders in the ecosystem. Uh, government's obviously a huge one. Uh, the most common thing that governments care about around the world is taxes. Uh, in that regard, we've helped yeah. facilitate the collection yeah. of taxes right. uh, in 300 different municipalities. We've collected $300 million to date. Um, but governments also care about other things. You know, uh, here in China, uh, bringing the benefits of digital economy to rural areas is an important theme and topic. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in that regard, we did a partnership with uh, a village in Guilin, uh, where we've taken some villagers and we put them on the Airbnb platform and helped them to provide authentic rural experiences. Um, and so I think there's a lot of creative ways in which you can build bridges between you know, this new stuff uh, and, and stakeholders that might not 
know how to engage it, but with some creative thinking, you can build a bridge. Hmm. That's uh, fascinating. Uh, other questions? See any other panel paddles here? No? Uh, don't be shy. This is a great group. Um, I want to ask, uh, you were discussing um, um, issues of, of keeping track of the data and who's using bikes where, and this is an issue for you uh, as well. Um, the bike sharing companies are interesting because they're all backed by um, uh, giants now. Giant tech companies that are hungry not just for the profits that they might make from the bike sharing themselves, but are really looking at the data as a, as a real kind of gold mine uh, for them that they can draw all kinds of other conclusions about how to sell the people uh, services that they can provide. Um, and, um, you know, you do a fair amount of that as well, trying to figure out how to uh, make the model more successful. Uh, one issue for you, I suspect, is, is the data. Where does it live, the data that's collected in China? The, how, do you, how are you affected by the new uh, cybersecurity laws and regulations in China? Uh, well, we're licensed here in China. We have an ICP license, right. and, and with that comes the responsibility uh, around data and other things. Um, and so, you know, Chinese data lives in China. Yeah. Um, and it takes a great deal of investment to make that possible. Um, that. But, you know, over the span of about a year and a half, uh, we've been able to do that segmentation. Right. So in the U.S., uh, OFO, uh, the payment is handled normally how? Uh, Ali, Alipay is not really that prominent in the US for <laughs> sure, Ofo, sure. so what do you do? In different countries, when we are making overseas expansion, now payment methodology will be the major problem in face of us. That is not only case in the US or in the European countries, because the European customers will prefer consumption by making use of credit card in our product philosophy, we do not force the users to change their you know, uh, consumption habits in this part. In our technological research and development, we are making deployments in the smart locks. You can swipe your credit cards to make payments, but if the users are willing to scan the QR code and many payments will also be in support of them. We know that OFO is universally used in the world. I hope that our product can provide a better service, deliver better customer experience for our users, not only in China, but in the world. The same case, we want to aim for provide a better convenience for our customers all across the world. You can swipe a card, scan the QR code, or the NFC technologies. You can make payments very conveniently. That is what we will do in the future. OFO could be a way uh, to kind of um uh, help Alipay to mm -hmm. expand overseas? I mean, because you could argue, obviously, that the best way for you to ensure that consumers have a smooth consumer experience is to use the payment app that works most effectively in your largest market. Uh, are you trying to, uh, I mean, is there any pressure from Alibaba to make sure that, from, from Ant Financial to make sure that you encourage overseas users to discover the magic and wonder of, uh, of Alipay? Uh, in actual fact, as we will know, we have numerous investors, not only including Alibaba. Didi is also investing in us. We have a lot of cooperative partners. We have a lot of resources can be shared. In foreign countries with the popularity of mobile payment, we are cooperating with Alipay in this part. But what's more important, we want to discuss on how to ensure smooth user experience. Internally, we have a team which is very interesting to tell. Our team has been working in joint efforts with the QR code scanning team of Alipay. You may think the QR coding scanning is very simple, but we have a team of over 10 employees working on improving the experience. So even you are in the remote answers, <laughs> All right, that's a very eloquent <laughs> diplomatic answer. But it sure, I was going to say, it, it, this is why Tencent and uh, Alibaba both pour so much money into white sharing. Right. And we, you, we, we saw that in 2013, right. 2014 right. in Kwai and DD, and it's yeah. being played out in uh, bike sharing right. as well. Right. Um, uh, fascinating. So the data that you collect, I mean, people to use uh, OFO bikes in the United States, they download it, an OFO app is how they use it, right? And that unlocks the. Uh, the lock. Um, how do you collect that data? 
where does that data go? Does it have to live on servers in the United States, just like Nate's China data China. has to live here? Uh, yes, about the user's data, we follow a basic principle. Number one, we want to ensure the security and privacy of the user data. We cannot leak or abuse the data of users. We might follow different appro approaches in foreign countries. In China, we have a data center. All the user's data will be recorded through now using experience. We are primarily making use of the data to analyze now behaviors which can facilitate our operational service. Besides, we can provide some consultancy or advisory service for the local planning authorities. But in foreign countries, we will set up our European-based data center, which will be in line with the regulations and laws in European countries. That means we will do our utmost to ensure the security and privacy of the data. We will never open our data to the third party. Uh, it's not legally uh, uh, the way it is in China with the cyber security law. You're not legally. You don't have to. You could bring the data back to servers in China if you wanted, right? Uh, when obtaining this data, we need to comply with the local laws and regulations. We cannot do it in the unregulated countries. So we have a legal complaints or legal at first department in terms of user's data, we want to ensure that we need to insist on our principles, especially security for the utilization of data. But one thing he pointed yeah. out is talent flow. Yeah. Because as you have all this unicorns that's emerging, especially in US and China, and you have all this talent who have experience and trained in one market, yeah. Yeah. you can see the talent flow to other markets right. and try to incorporate what I have learned and make it bigger somewhere else. Is it likely we could see a line bike OFO tie-up of some sort? They, they, they were rumored that they were discussing earlier. <laughs> I think there's always room for imagination, whether it's with OFO or a bike or, or a hello bike. But I think line bike also have a great opportunity to stay independent and go after US and even parts of Europe. So I think it's going to be very fun to see how it involved. Watch this space. Gentlemen, thank you. Great panel. Thank you. Thank them very much.